Joel, I'm so happy to be back with you on the podcast today. We have not recorded an episode in a hot minute. I don't even know if we've recorded an episode in 2024 yet. We took a little... Is true? I don't know. It feels, it feels true. Like it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's true. Let's go off the record if it's not true, but um, it's good to be back with you today. I'm so glad. I feel so like we have some back. catching up to do. Is there anything that you want to tell me about? Um, and I'm not asking about your sports teams. I'm asking about you. Yeah, that's true. What have you had going on? Seems you're not doing very well right now. <laughs> so we could just skip uh, right over that one. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah, actually, honestly, uh, a big update in my world is on March 5th, my first book ever, The Hidden Piece, uh, came out into the world. Yay. Um, and so that's been super exciting that's and so, so awesome. fun. Um, on tour, it was a lot of fun because we were able to go out and just um, get feedback from people that are reading the book and um, highlight. I had one gal that came and she had already bought the book and she had highlighted it all up. And then she got another one for her friend because her friend wanted to borrow her book. But she's like, you can't borrow my book because it's all highlighted. And, you know, and, you know, like Lisa always teaches us that when somebody stops highlighting your book, they stop reading a book. That's right. And if they stop reading a book. They'll never recommend it to a friend. That's right. Do I need to keep going? <laughs> no, I mean, you are a, a walking dictionary of Lisa Turkism. Tur- <laughs> Turkisms? Turkerstisms? Sure. Yes. Yeah, it is. You're right. It is your podcast episode. So <laughs> while she's not here, we'll go yeah. with that. Okay. So today's conversation, we're going to talk about decisions. Yeah. And maybe some of this relates to when you were trying to make a decision about writing your first book oh. um, of like, you know, just when you're trying to figure out, is this something I'm going to do? Mm-hmm. You're like weighing the pros and cons. I don't know what decision making looks like for you, but we'll get into it. But when I think about big decisions in my life, I think about my move to Charlotte. And in 2017, I was wrapping up college and I was interviewing for jobs and I was interviewing with Lisa for the position that I'm in now. But I knew that if I took this position, I was going to have to move. Mm. No one else in my family at the time lived outside of my immediate family, lived outside of Birmingham, Alabama, where I was. And I had actually never even visited Charlotte before I accepted this job, which is kind of wild. Um, Probably should have asked more questions. But, you know, when you're when you're 21 and someone wants to employ you. Yeah. Sometimes the, the, the process is pretty simple. But I just remember like weighing all those pros and cons of just you know, is this the right decision for me? How do I know that this is right? How do I know that God is okay with this decision? And then at some point you kind of reach a place with with decision making where you kind of have to make a decision, even if you don't have 100% clarity, or if you feel like you 100% haven't heard from God, or you might even still be torn. Mm -hmm. With me, I felt like I just reached a very clear moment of I had no reservations. All signs were pointing to this was like the right decision. And I just told myself too, if something happened and this wasn't like the right path for me or whatever, I'm not stuck here forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seven years later, I'm still here, and, still I'm here. <laughs> and I'm happy and I'm thriving. But I think a lot of us have had these big pivotal decisions in our life. But then also sometimes they're just daily decisions. Mm-hmm. Like I know you and I have talked a lot about budgeting this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Joel's in his budget era. Yeah, for sure. Um, and even that is decision making as you're thinking about what am I prioritizing? Yeah, what you am know? I valuing? What is, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'd love for us to talk today just about how can we as believers make decisions confidently bringing God into the process, which I know that probably sounds weird because he's always with us, but how can we make informed, competent decisions as believers, whether it's something big like a job, a move, Mm -hmm. maybe a decision to grow your family, or even something as as simple as, you know, should I reach out to this person? Is this a relationship I should prioritize? Um, What should I prioritize in my budget? Like just things like that. What what thoughts do you have? Well, I think it's first and foremost incredibly important that I just on behalf of Proverbs 31 Ministries and Lisa Turkers and our entire team. We want to thank you, Shay Tate Hill, for (laughs) saying yes to Proverbs and being here all these seven years. We're just very grateful. I'm very grateful for you and for your friendship. I'm Um, grateful too. I'm thankful they've let me grow up here, you know? That's right. (laughs) That's right. Um, So I just, I think it's important. I want to acknowledge like um, decision making is hard. You just described it. Yeah. It's hard. There's a tension that's built into it. Um, And there's also the sense of, if I make this decision, what are the consequences of that? But also, if I don't make the decision, yep. what are the consequences of that? And so I actually think that there can be a pendulum swing that typically happens with decision making. Uh, and I've personally experienced this. One, we make decisions way too fast. We're a bit reckless. We're loose with it. And we're just like, 
I'm going to do whatever I want to do, you know? And the first good thing that pops into your mind, that's what you do. But then the second, and I kind of call this uh, paralysis of decision-making, we deliberately overthink things. Mm -hmm. Lisa has a whole chapter in this. Uh, in the best, yes, called analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis, yeah, exactly. It's so real, and and um, and you're just consumed with all the variables and all of the what ifs, and then what ends up happening is um, you don't make any decision, or the decision that you do make, you're so stressed out about the decision that you made right. that you forever you can't live in the moment of your decision, you're living in the what if of what if I made the wrong decision in it, you know? And I think both of those things are really challenging. And so um, what we have is this pendulum swing on both sides. But at the root of this, I think, is a response of fear. So on the one side, like our, our lack of making decisions, it could be fear, like oriented, what if? But on the opposite side of it is a lack of like proper fear. <laughs> You know, like if you're making decisions way too fast, there might be indication that you have not been fully considerate of all the implications of this. So I want to go back to your your experience. You know, um, what was it? What was like the stress moments for you in trying to make this decision? And then how did you actually overcome it? Like, how did you finally make the decision to where we are now seven years later? Yeah, I think for me, that decision to move and to accept this job was a little bit layered because there was definitely an element of like firsts with this. Mm -hmm. Like I'd never walked the process. So if we're going back to fear, I'd say that would be fear of the unknown. Just experiencing a lot of unknowns for the first time. Like, am I even asking the right questions? Am I even doing the right research? And then I would say fear of the future too. I think sometimes when we're trying to make a decision, we're trying to decide for the right now and for the forever. Mm -hmm. And that's like, we can't mm -hmm. know that. And sometimes yep. that's where we get tripped up is, you know, my husband and I are like in the process of buying a house right now, our first home. And I'm even thinking about it where it's like, we're trying to make a decision for right now that will also feel good X amount of years later. Yeah. And trying to juggle that can be difficult. Um, so fear of the unknown, fear of the future. And then probably too, just a little bit of like fear of letting God down. That might mm. sound weird, but like, I think, yeah. Like, does God approve of this decision? Yeah. Is this, a, is this his next, is his, the, is this his best next step for me in this season? Mm -hmm. And feeling like, I think sometimes I've heard Christians really oversell, like how God will speak to us in those moments. Like, it's not like he parts the sky like a whiteboard and writes right. like something. I mean, that would be awesome. That if would did. be great. That hasn't been my experience. And so if you just have a lack of confidence or clarity that you feel like God is, you know, on board with this decision, I think that can also paralyze you. Yeah, I think that's so good. And I think one of the things that, that you said there that's so important for us, especially as people that love Jesus, we want to honor God with our decision-making processes. Um, and we also want to be in God's will. Like we want to do the things that God wants yeah. us to do. And so I think the decision-making part of it is actually tightly connected to this concept of what is God's will for our lives. Because if we don't make, if we're making decisions disconnected from God's will, then we feel like we're living rogue and rebellious, right? right? In our life. And, and... If we're making decisions connected to God's will, now there's this overwhelming fear of, did I get God's will right? Right. And where that's where I get tripped up with this is it's easier for me to spot things in my life that if I chose to walk in this, it would be sin. Mm -hmm. It's like that feels pretty obvious, like it's not going to be in God's will. But like this move, for example, it wasn't sin for me to move to Charlotte. It wasn't sin for me to accept this job, but I didn't know if it was right for yeah, me. You know, is. and Absolutely. so that's where I think it's difficult. We're not just talking about weighing like good and bad things. It's like sometimes zero, all the options, none of them are bad, yeah. inherently sinful, yeah. but you're just trying to figure out what God's will is for you. Exactly. Yeah. So I want to talk about um, two types of God's will. Okay. And this is kind of like the theological framework that is, I think, going to be super helpful for us to be able to then make the connection to our discernment and, and what we do and probably actually take the weight of ownership that we're carrying that is actually not even ours to carry, but 
still maintain the level of responsibility that God absolutely wants us to be responsible for. So the hear it. the two types of will that theologians, scholars forever have been, they've used different names for it. Um, and so I'll give kind of like the way that I think it's the easiest for us to understand. Um, and then also I'll give you kind of some of the technical terms for it. Um, but the first one is God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will. Sometimes this is referred to as God's prescriptive will. Um, my seminary professor, Dr. John Frame, has an incredible book out on this um, where he talks about these two types of wills. But um, God's sovereign will is this idea that God is king and God is sovereign over all of creation. There's not an ounce, this is Psalm 46, there's not an ounce of creation that God is not in control over, right? He has true power, strength, and stability. Like he is the one who holds all together. So God's sovereign will. Um, in God's sovereign will, God also has uh, a secondary aspect of his will, which is called God's will of command. Sometimes it's called his, um, his, de- his will of decree or his will of command. So God's sovereign will is irrefutable. Like there's actually nothing really you and I can do to be out of God's sovereign will. Uh, God willed for Jesus to come through the incarnation, to defeat death through death on a cross, and to uh, have the the possibility for humanity to be reconciled together. That's all part of God's sovereign will, right? Um, and then you have God's will of command, God's God's um, moral desire for humanity. Now, this is the one that can be a little bit uh, tricky in this sense. You and I have been given agency, human agency, in order to make moral decisions. Mm-hmm. We can make a decision of, do I want Pepsi or do I want Diet Pepsi? I've been telling our friends- Do I want Coca-Cola? You probably don't want Coke. Unless you're overseas. Overseas Coke is very, very good. Like in the bottle, that's excellent. But outside of that, you know, but, but like this is, you have agency. You can exercise your your will to to a degree. And with that, there is this sense that um, God has a moral impulse for you and I to live out with that is in conjunction with his sovereign will. And there's a freedom here because in God's moral will or his will of command, you and I can step out of that and still be in God's sovereign will. Mm -hmm. Now, are there consequences to the decisions that we make if we, if it's outside of God's will of command. Absolutely. Right? Adam and Eve. <laughs> Adam and Eve, for <laughs> yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Um, or even think about this. Like, I, I, I do this with my kids all the time. There's a path that's in front of them. And mom and I, like their, their mom and I, we know that this particular path is going to be relatively easy in the sense of there's going to be some hard work up front called the dishes. But once you're done with the dishes, man, we're going to have so much fun. Mm-hmm. We're going to have popcorn. They're going to have popcorn. I don't like popcorn. They're going to eat popcorn. We're going to watch a movie. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be fun, right? Now, they have uh, a will of their own, and they can decide to go and to, to do the dishes and then enjoy what's on the opposite end, or as my children sometimes do, they can forget to do the dishes. Mm-hmm. But here's the deal. The dishes still got to get done. Right. And now that they've gone into disobedience because they haven't done the dishes, there's just a cost associated with it. Yeah. So on this one, they're not going to get the popcorn. They might still get the movie, but they're not going to get the popcorn. Or they might not get the popcorn or the movie, but they're going to do the dishes and they're going to have a time to go on a walk as a family. Like there's different outcomes that are there. All of this is still contained in what? The dishes got done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a non-condition, like the dish is going to get done. And so I think when we're thinking about God's will, it's important for us to start to think through what is God's sovereign will? Well, God's sovereign will is for um, for us to enjoy him, for us to be reconciled to him, for us to, right? Like he's got this, this sovereign will that's out there. Now, how does that execute itself? How does it flush itself out in his will of command? Um, we have a responsibility to know him, to know his word, to um, to do things that are wise and, and be discerning, which is going to lead us to kind of the next part of this question. Um, but hopefully this now gives you a little bit of a relief to know that you're not in control over God's sovereign will. Like that is going to happen. The dishes are going to get done. Mm-hmm. You know, you are in control over it and you do have agency and responsibility for how that plays out in your 
specific life, with the decisions that you make or that you don't make. And so with that, we have to be responsible for things that we can be responsible for and not get caught into and entrapped in decisions for things that we don't have control over. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think that's really good. So do you want to talk through, now that we've learned the difference between these two, how this fleshes out into the practical level of making decisions. Yeah, uh, probably one of my favorite verses uh, in in Proverbs. Uh, and, you know, verses in Proverbs, we have to remember that these are principles to live by. They're not like commands or promises that mm -hmm. we're supposed to uh, expect. So here's a principle uh, in Proverbs 16, 9. A person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. Mm -hmm. So what do you see right there? Even in that verse, you find sovereign will of command, the Lord determines the steps, but you also find God's will of command, that there is moral agency for the person to plan their ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're listening, you're just like, okay, how does this actually work? Like, how does this actually flesh itself out? So I'm going to go back to, to you, Shay. Okay. Um, how did you weigh out the pros and cons of moving to a city that you never even visited before? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I knew that I, I actually never thought that working in ministry outside of a church was like an op opportunity. And I really didn't know that much about Proverbs 31 ministries and Lisa at the time, but getting to work in an ministry environment was super intriguing to me. I knew that Charlotte was still drivable to my family. So that was appealing. How to did me. you know that Charlotte was drivable to your family? Because like, get I, very practical. Oh, I because re I researched. I know. You're like an epic researcher. <laughs> when we're out on tour, like you knew where every YMCA was. You even <laughs> yeah. helped me to figure out where my gyms were. Like, it was <laughs> excellent. Listen, on tour, you have to put on your research <laughs> you hat. put on your research it's, hat. It's survival, yeah. Okay, but look what you just did. Agency. You just took human responsibility. Right, that's true. With a decision that was there. Okay, so keep going. So you've got the distance, yep. right? Um, how did you deal with the unknown of like Charlotte? Like, what is the difference between Charlotte and Birmingham? Or yeah, you, that's yeah. right. Um, you mean as like a culture? Yeah, yeah. Like, how did you overcome that? I, well, I did actually visit, but I had already accepted the job. But I think I knew that a lot of um, young people had started moving here. And how so did you know that? I don't know. I also knew SEC Network was here, and I ah, love sports, there you go. so I knew that was here. But I, so I think I realized because it's the I think I've heard it called like the banking capital of yep, the South, yep. mm -hmm. and so I knew a lot of people with like Bank of America being here and all of that. I knew like a lot of young people would move here if yep. they like felt too overwhelmed by like a move to New York or something like that. They would move to. Charlotte. And what does it tell you if a lot of young people are moving here? What is the possibility for you? That, that I sense. could like find myself friends and community and other people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Like we're literally going through the process here. Mm -hmm. Like how do you make decisions? Well, you do some research. Yeah. You consider, have other people gone this road before? If yeah. they have, probably want to ask them some questions. Right. So let me just kind of walk One through. One more thing I want to okay. add too yeah. is every person in my life that had kind of walked through college with me or like mentors felt very good about this decision as well, which was kind of like that moment where you're bringing all someone information that you've gathered or research and then you're saying like this is all that i know what do you think kind of okay. like poke holes in my research process and everyone felt great about it okay so this is so good um so you have a scale right and the scale is neutral at the, at the starting point mm -hmm. and, and there's just like an ambiguous thesis like the thesis statement on academics i'm using that word but basically like the goal is like okay sh or the question is um should we move to should i move to charlotte or mm -hmm. not and then you put pros and cons on it and you go through um some research and you go through some other stuff right and eventually the value proposition weighs itself out where you go this is an acceptable decision yeah like there's enough information here that lets me know that could it potentially be hard? Yeah. Could it even be the wrong thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But is there more weight to the possibility of good and the potential there than it being wrong and right. it's all bad? It's like, all right, great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is the same decisions that I make in the morning before I go out uh, to uh, like my day. Like today, the shoes that I'm wearing, I typically wouldn't wear if it was raining. Right. And I looked at the weather and there was like no rain in the forecast. Y'all, you know what happened? Right when I got in my car and I was driving in this way, it started to drizzle. 
and I got stressed out, you know? Listen, I had done everything I possibly could. I looked at the weather, I looked, you know, and it's like, it is what it is, right? And so we're fine, my shoes are okay. But let me- Praise uh, God. Let me walk <laughs> through a couple steps here, okay. biblically, like theologically, scripturally, that I think that we find consistently throughout scripture that's gonna help us in our decision-making as we, like what Proverbs 69 says, we are gonna plan wisely, mm-hmm. we're gonna discern to the best of our ability, and we're going to take confidence and have safety and security in knowing that God's sovereign will is still going to be had. The dishes are still going to get done. Yeah, right? that's good. Okay, so here, here's the first thing. Um, it's through prayer. Like, and our friend Jim Cress always says this, like, you guys are like, that's so simple. Well, it's simple, but it's also, like, not simplistic, you know? Um, I struggle with prayer. I've said this before, Shay, you've heard me say this. I can study deep Bible theology. I can get into Greek and Hebrew and do all that kind of stuff. You ask me to sit here and pray for five minutes? I kind of just struggle with that, you know? I'm the same way. The only thing that's helped me is writing my prayers out. There we go. That's like, that's really helped me stay focused. Yeah. And like, so for me, I've had to turn into like a conversation, yeah. you know, where it's like, I almost like imagine God speaking back. And often when I'm hearing him speak back, it's just his scripture, like stuff that I've read before. And it's like, that's how I was com- communicating back. So it's like through prayer. Um, Prayer is so incredibly vital because prayer is a means of communication Mm -hmm. that turns our relationship with God from being something that is a monologue one way conversation to a dialogue that's two way. The Holy Spirit is is communicating back to us. So um, the first thing and I please do like don't overlook this y'all like pray and ask God for a sense of clarity in this decision. The second thing, and you mentioned this one, is through um, other members of God's family. Mm -hmm. Like the Holy Spirit is working through them and they've got transferable wisdom. Right. That is so important. Maybe one of the best pieces of advice that I got, Shay, when uh, Bryn and I first got married uh, was uh, um, our pastor, Pastor Bob. He said, hey, I want you guys to identify three different types of couples. The first couple um is going to be like y'all y'all are in the thick of like y'all are in the exact same spot so they're yeah, just your friends like side by side side by side couple exactly the second couple is they're about two to five years ahead of you you know so they've got their first kid maybe on the way that maybe are two like they whatever that life sees and and um and for that couple like for the side by side couple y'all just live life together anyways but for that couple you're never going to ask them to bring food you're never gonna like you're gonna say hey what's an open day in our calendar can we bring the food to you Mm -hmm. because that they are stressed out right (laughs) like like we have been that couple forever where it's like our goal is to get to the nine o'clock service which means we're gonna get to 10 15. like that's just how we live because it's hard right okay that's the second couple the third couple are empty nesters like you look at them and go oh my gosh they still love each other they've got grandchildren that, that adore them they've got children that they're still talking to and with them this is what you're going to do. You're going to be like, can we get on your calendar? Like, we just want to spend time with you and just hang out. And this is what they're going to say. Oh, we're all like, you know, we're so unfun. I go to sleep at seven o'clock. And this is what you say. Great. We'll be there at five. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, like you, you seek after them. And this is really important. The transferable wisdom that they have has been hard earned in different seasons of life so that the wisdom they can give you as you're making discerning choices is going to be vitally helpful because you've got a treasure trove of experience here, yeah. you know, that's going to help you see blind spots that you potentially couldn't see before. This is the beauty of God's family. Totally. And I would say, too, like when I'm even thinking back on the move here, like it was the first time I was making that decision or a decision like that. But having people in my life, that was not the first decision they had made some like that, you know, and so I was able to glean from their wisdom in a way that it really brought like peace and comfort knowing that I could glean from their wisdom and their experience, even though I felt overwhelmed by the process. Absolutely. I love that. Um, And then the the next one. Um, and really the last one is fasting. Now I know people are like, what? Fasting that feels so like like s- super spiritual. Um, you know, throughout the Old Testament, God's people fasted right before they had to make important decisions. They would fast before a king would be um, anointed. Kings would fast before big military decisions. So like, what is it about fasting? And I don't want to get legalistic with this, but I want to get to the principle of the idea of fasting. The idea of fasting is that you're intentionally withholding something that you genuinely enjoy and value And in the tension of that pain of not experiencing that thing, you're going to commit to praying and seeking God. And here's something that's fascinating. We get sharper. Our brains are kind of like, it's almost like 
as we fast, our our body is physiologically getting disrupted in such a way that our thinking changes. Our we're more perceptive. Like we just get sharper in in those yeah. moments. It's like fasting is a focus. Like it yes. it helps produce focus. It helps produce focus. Mm-hmm. It helps clarity of mind. You know, um, I do this thing now called cold plunging. It's like you know, kind of a thing that people do apparently. I too uh, have tried. The cold yes, plunging. yes, yeah. I know. With our friend Jess Connolly. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and you know, the cold plunge thing is fascinating because it shocks your body, mm-hmm. and instantly you're trying to like escape. You want to get the heck out. Mm-hmm. But then uh, this was this has been my experience. I've got such mental fortitude for the rest of that day. Like I am so clearly like there's something that's happening that God has designed our body where these types of withdrawal or doing hard things is producing focus. And I love that. Um, and then um, just from a practical standpoint, we're going to trust the spirit to lead us in in those two things through prayer, through other family members um, in God's uh, family and then through fasting. And then the spirit's going to lead us through that. And then this kind of um, safety net here. With faith, even if we take a misstep, we know that God's sovereign will is still in control. The dishes are still going to get done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and God is more than capable of taking our missteps and turning them into a path for his ultimate will to be done in our lives. Right, because he's writing our life story. Yeah. I, I As I think about the process that you're kind of lying out for us, outlining for us really of how to help, how to have it an informed decision-making process. It kind of reminds me of the bumpers that we will sometimes put up to go bowling. And it's like those bumpers are helping make sure that the bowling ball is going somewhere. And I think about those as like guardrails as you're making an informed process. So it's not like, like don't get legalistic with it, with like prayer or fasting or any of these, but these are just supporting things that God has given us access to that can help us make informed decisions. And um, as we were preparing for today, I was reminded of a devotional that's inside Lisa Turker's book, You're Going to Make It. And I wanted to share some of these questions. Um, This is from day 25, I think, because I think they're so helpful in just kind of adding like another layer in a decision-making process of um, removing the mystery and removing the confusion and let's just go ahead and speak life over someone. God is already well pleased with you. You don't have to earn that. Like we we speak that shame off of you. So Mm. listen to these questions just as you're thinking about making a decision. Um, Is this leading you closer to God's best or deterring you away from it? Is this supported by the wisdom of trusted friends who lean on God's word and listen to God's leading? You talked about the family of God there. When you ask for other people's advice, are you withholding any necessary details, hoping they will agree with you rather than challenge you? Just a question of honesty. Yes. Being truly honest with yourself and with others. Yes. Um, When you think about this decision, do you feel more at peace or panicked? Now, this one is a little hard because how many times have you heard someone say, I feel peace or I didn't feel peace? Mm -hmm. So in like 30 seconds, can you give us a little rundown of what it means to have have peace because sometimes we have to move forward in things that we do not feel peace about at all it is not what we would have chosen for ourselves yeah i think peace is a settled assurance that you've done all that you can yeah with that's good what you have that's good that's good and if you've done all that you can with what you have in front of you then you can have peace and still feel attention of okay we're going to process through it now yeah that's good and then the last one is what will this decision cost you and it is a cost that you're willing to pay so i hope some of these bullet point questions really help someone listening today just as they're trying to navigate a decision or just uh maybe this is an episode that you can turn back to when you're trying to make a decision in the future um but thanks for everything that you brought today joel is there anything else you want to add before we close out today no i love it and i just want to encourage you that um it feels like decision making is a muscle that needs to be exercised and as we exercise this muscle we'll learn that the more we focus on these principles, the better it's going to help us in the process so that there's less of um, that internal turmoil that ends up happening. It's not that the decision making isn't going to get easier or it's going to get harder. It's just that that internal turmoil of getting to that next thing is going to become easier just because we're learning to be more dependent on God. Yeah. And we have the weight of responsibility of things that we ought not to be responsible of lifted off of our shoulders, which is so freeing. And where we are struggling, God's grace will fill the gap every single time. 